Steve Carlton, to me, was the most consistent pitcher I was ever around. I considered Steve to be royalty on the mound. When he was on the mound, it was like a king. You talk about the, the ultimate warrior, the guy that had heart, the guy that had head. He's an acutely intelligent guy with a wonderful sense of humor. I tell you what, he's a good guy to try to emulate because uh, when I came up, he was definitely living life as, at the fullest. My philosophy of life was to set up a, 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 an attitude that would last me a career, you know, and, and I didn't waver from when I When I won a game, as soon as that game was over with, it was, you know, uh, see you later, bring on the next one. You know, let's, let's have it, let's get it, because it has to be done that way. It was difficult, but I, I, I'd, I'd understood that if I'm going to make a transition here and not look back and not think about baseball all the time, then, you know, something has to replace that, you know. So there's a lot to absorb yourself in, intellectually if you choose to, I mean spiritually if you choose to. But to dwell on the game I think would would destroy everything that I believe in. I, I think I would I would start to wane in so many ways that it would not be beneficial to my spiritual and physical and mental intellectual well-being. So be that as it may, I choose to proceed down this particular path. I mean not this one but the path in general. <laughs> And this is, a, this is a wonderful place to be. Bev and I are extremely comfortable here. The, the, the land feels good. The energy of the land is wonderful. And, and the trees don't talk back. In 1988, Steve Carlton ended a brilliant 25-year career as a professional athlete. His statistical achievements were sterling enough to garner him first ballot admission to the Baseball Hall of Fame. While his accomplishments on the field spoke volumes about his desire and ability, his introverted and private nature helped to create a veil of mystery for the fans. The following profile attempts to dissolve the Carlton mystique through the words and stories of his colleagues to the insights of the man himself. It is a portrait of a proud and complex man who passionately reveled in the game of baseball, and more importantly, the game of life. The man simply known by his fans and peers as Lefty. Back in 1965, uh, Steve Carlton came to his first Major League camp. He was 10-1 and one at Winnipeg uh, the year before. And uh, the most dominant trait of Lefty at that time was his Adam's apple. He was, he was so thin and so tall, and obviously he was to fill out and become one of the strongest guys that I've ever met pound for pound. But uh, he was, in a very quiet way, very, very cocky, uh, very self-assured, uh, very confident. Uh, but a lot of people didn't know it because he rarely said anything. Well, on about our, our second outing, I think Steve had gone about four innings. Now, keep in mind that the year before, the Cardinals were world champions. I had a good series, and uh, you know we were pretty confident ourselves that spring. Well, I'm in there shaving. Kenny Boyer's here. Dick Groat's here. And I hear uh, footsteps behind me. And it's uh, the tall guy with the dominant trait as the Adam's apple. He's standing behind me, and he kind of swallows. He goes... And he was a little nervous. He said, tap me on the shoulder and saw him through the mirror. And, I, you know, I've got shaving cream about halfway uh, off my face. And he said, you've got to call more breaking balls behind in the count. And I went, I, I went crazy. I snapped. I said, what, who are you to tell me? I mean, what kind of success have you had? You're telling me that I've got to call more breaking balls? I mean, what gives you the right to say, well, we stood toe to toe and I'm looking up naturally. I mean, at that time, I wasn't but 23 years old. Steve was uh, 21, 2021, 20, and all the veterans on the ball club were, uh, were laughing at, at the situation, and I guess now I can laugh about it, and, and certainly Lefty can too. <laughs> Tim McCarver had a great knack of getting close to pitchers, and young pitchers, but he and Tim had their falling out for sure, especially in the first part of Steve's career, because Steve is a very headstrong person, and uh, he makes up his mind to do something, or the way he's going to do it, he doesn't deviate from it very much. And of course, McCarver's about the same, so you have two hardheads knocking uh, against concrete there. 
We were both very impressionable at, at that time, and we had a lot of great teachers in the Cardinal organization. And the players were so good. Dick Grote, Bill White, Kenny Boyer, Julian Javier, Kurt Flood, Bob Gibson. Gibson was, was quite a force. And, and, and Lefty always said that, that, that the mound was Bob Gibson's office that when hitters made outs, they didn't come back through. You know, Pete Rose used to try to intimidate pitchers, especially young pitchers. He'd make an out, and then he'd run across the mound, and, and even at times make the pitcher move. To, they never did that with Gibson. And Steve said, you know, that's the way I should handle myself. And when I get a little success, that's what's going to be. Nobody's going to come in my office, and nobody did. He got in a few kitchens, but nobody came in his office. When I was young, I was frightened to throw inside, and you're afraid about hit guys. And Timmy always had me knock guys down at the right time. And if a guy was really hurting the ball club, I mean, you straighten him up or you know, knock, push him back. But you'd get it in there. He'd sit behind the, the hitter where I couldn't see him. You know, so I had to throw at the hitter. When you're looking at him and, and, and see him out on the mound, you know, he was a he was a tall, very tall guy, very imposing. You know, and when he threw, uh, you know, his arm would almost looked like it was right in your face, you know. One of my great stories about uh, Steve Carlton is with my good friend, the Hall of Famer here, Red Shaney's. When Steve first came up, Red would uh, say, get, uh, get what's his name up there? Tall boy, get tall boy up. And he called him tall boy for about the first two weeks. And then after Steve showed him his stuff, he's get Steve Carlton up, please. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, Bev and I met in, in Canada at the ballpark uh, in 1964. I played up there for the, the Winnipeg Gold Eyes. And, you know, she's sort of a sports fan, but she was always, you know, like my fan. You know, there's a lot of travel in sports, and, and there's, uh, you know, it has to be done. And, you know, she raised the boys and did a wonderful job. You know, I was there only, you know, I'm a part-time father, you know, see them when you can during the season and then you have four months off and then it's your back at it so you know you miss a lot of the growing times with the with the kids and uh, I've, I've seen a, a, a number of ball players quit the game prematurely because of the family situation you know uh, their wives would put pressure on them to retire when they could have pitched two or three four more years and Bev I mean, encouraged me fully all along the way to play until we couldn't play, until they ripped the uniform off your backs. Nineteen seventy-two, the opening day of spring training. Yeah, Bing Divine calls me about eight eight thirty in the morning, and uh, it tells me in so many words that I got traded to the to the lowly Phillies at that time. And uh, I guess it's a it's a matter of fact that uh, he and Mr. Bush. And, and Bing Devine had had a disagreement um, over salary. I said, Bing, 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 can we, you know, can we reconsider, you know? I said, we were extremely fortunate that um, Bing Devine, I don't know which clubs he called first, but certainly we must have been near the top of the list, possibly because geographically Clearwater was close to St. Pete, where they were, where they were having their spring, uh, spring train. And here, here I am off to a uh, last place ball club feeling that, you know, you lost your best friend kind of a situation. And Rick Wise was a pretty good pitcher, but we'd all been fortunate enough to see Steve pitch. And it was, Mr. Quinn, if you can make that deal, God, make it as soon as you can. So really, for a big deal like it is, uh, it was probably the fastest deal with two, two yeah. or three five-minute phone calls that was ever made. Steve Carlton captured the imagination and affection of the fans like no Philadelphia sports figure before. The love affair was achieved with style and brilliance. Steve Carlton was a great pitcher in St. Louis. He came to the Phillies in a deal for Rick Wise that shocked both cities. The trade was a blessing in disguise is what it turned out to be. I'm extremely happy to be in Philadelphia. Uh, I wouldn't want it any other way now. But it turned out to be a blessing in disguise. I'd never, I'd, I'd, I got more entrenched mentally than I've ever, ever been in my, my life because it was like, perceived desperate situation at the time. The, the thing that I remember in that year more than anything it was we had a very bad baseball team. It was young, but every fifth day when he pitched, he seemed to elevate everybody's play. I mean, we knew as a team 
that if we went out and scored one or two runs, we had a chance of winning. Being an infielder, playing behind Steve Carlton makes playing baseball a pleasure. The reason for this is because uh, when he gets on the mound, he doesn't pitch, pitch it with his cap or play around with a rosin bag. He get, looks down, gets a sign, and he's in complete command with all his pitches. He's a great person. He's a great team man. And I think he's been a big inspiration, not only to the people here in Philadelphia, but for the young ball players that are on this ball club. All he wanted was the same that I did, I guess, is that he wanted 24-hour-a-day dedication to whatever you were doing. And then in 72, I really thrived on all the work. I was in a tremendous groove. I was so incredibly focused mentally. I just uh, hardly ever threw a ball over the heart of the plate. I was just so, so entrenched. Never looked at the hitter, you know, just I was wired as far as where I was going to throw the pitch. Throw any pitch, any time, and it was just the team, the team rallied and, and played such a, a wonderful game of defense, and they, they got runs for me, and, and we made the best of uh, the situation that had uh, limited ability at that time. You know. When the season ended, he had won 27 ball games. He would lead the National League in strikeouts, innings pitch, earned run average. And when the season ended, Steve Carlton, by unanimous vote of the nation's sports writers, won the coveted Cy Young Award, emblematic of the best pitcher in the National League. To show their appreciation, the Phillies and the fans gave him a special night. 1972, a season Steve Carlton and Philadelphia will never forget. We had no idea we'd end up here in the southwest, you know, corner of Colorado, in the mountains. Wanted to do something different, you know, and uh, maybe get back to nature or something. You know, maybe have a garden, which on a golf course lot there was no room for a garden and uh, fruit trees. I was raised in a nursery when I was a kid, you know, for about the first five years, and there's a, a diversity of things you can plant in these areas and in, in, in the Four Corners area here. So. Yeah, as soon as we got off the plane, we looked around, there's mountains all around, and said, God, this is wonderful. This, you know, it's, it's, it felt like you were home. Nobody ever taught me the slider. You know, when, when I started working with it, uh, it was probably 1968, I probably was played around a little bit. Then the uh, Cardinals went to play the, the Japanese teams in 1968. And we were over there, and Sadaharu Oh had hit a home run off me. So I thought, well, I'm going to intimidate this guy. So I started throwing the slider, and I threw it right at him, you know, right in his ribs. And, the, and he just, you know, he flew back like this, and a, and a ball came over the plate for a strike, and then I knew I had him. The thing that, 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 that stands out in my mind more than anything is how many right-handers missed the slider. I mean, it was an unhittable pitch, needless to say. used to sit down behind home plate um, with a ground crew behind the glass where you could really get a feel of what was going on and you could see the plate on the that great slider that he threw. Oh. <laughs> I used to get amazed by the number of guys that would come to first base. I'm talking about good players. And they would maybe walk on a three and two pitch. And they look at me and they say, how in the hell could Lefty throw me a slider three and two? That's Lefty. You see, Lefty would never give in to you as a hitter. If you were going to beat Steve Carlton, you were going to beat him with his pitch. His slider broke so quickly and so late that often the hitter would think it was a strike, and it wasn't. I didn't know until I got traded to the Cubs how tough it was to hit that pitch, because I was saying, sure, something, how are they missing it by that much? I learned right away that it was an unhittable pitch for right-handers, and, you know, there was no sense in even playing them to pull. The lefty was so great, he really didn't even need a catcher. Yeah. <laughs> he just needed somebody to go retrieve from the backstop after they swung and missed it. This is an important question. It's the most important question anyone should ask themselves in life. Why do you think you were put on this earth? 
uh, teach the world how to throw a slider. And I remember one day Dick Ruthven asking him how he threw that slider. So le Lefty very simply picked the ball out of the bag and he said, I hold it like this and I throw the shit out of it. That's Bev's first horse. Shamir is her name. Appaloosa Arabian Nix. She just floats when she runs. And that's my horse Rio over there. Rio! Shamir, num 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 num. Rio! Rio's just like me. He's very independent. <laughs> he doesn't cooperate with the media whatsoever. Uh, it was in the mid-1970s. Uh, uh, He'd been talking to the media quite a lot uh, after the 1972 season. Uh, and then he began to limit it a little bit. He would uh, talk uh, after he pitched, after he was a winning pitcher, that type of thing. And then he kind of felt like he was burned a few times with some of the stories that were written. Uh, he told me once, he said, I spent uh, quite a lot of time after the game uh, talking to a whole group of writers. And the next day in the papers, none of the things I said were printed. And From your mouth, do you have a need to be understood, Steve? No. I think initially Steve took it very seriously because he felt like he was spending too much time with the writers, too much time explaining some of the things that he does, and, and not enough time in, in going about it. So he want, what he wanted to do was rid himself of all the outside activity. I never um, got into any involved discussions with Steve about the position he took um, regarding the media. I, I just felt, well, we're paying him to pitch. I, th I don't think he was ever comfortable talking to the media. And I think that probably was uh, one of the big reasons, uh, above everything else, that he stopped talking. And Stan Hockman, one of the fine writers in Philadelphia, would walk up to me and ask me if I could please ask Steve Carlton if he would talk with him and answer some questions about the game. Stan did this every, every single game. And I would walk over, look over to Lefty and say, Lefty, will you talk to Stan? And Lefty would say, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to talk to anybody. And so I'd look over to Stan and say, Stan, he's not going to talk to you. What if you, in your next life you were reincarnated as a sports writer? What a, what a coup de grace. <laughs> <laughs> you know, living, living here in uh, southwestern Colorado, we knew we wanted to do certain things. We wanted to have control of our own energy we wanted our own water you know we have our own our solar power here and it's working wonderful for us it's it's a great feeling to turn the lights on and don't care if you ever turn them off you know it, it's a, it's a great feeling it's a wonderful feeling to just have your own power you know, watching the uh, the slow erosion of our environment and our quality of air and water and one thing always comes to mind that uh, mother nature bats last as long as she doesn't come to the plate right here though <laughs> During the decade of the 70s, the Phillies front office began to assemble a talented cast of players to complement the powerful left arm of Steve Carlton. By the end of the decade, they had clearly become the dominant team of the National League East. Those teams of the 70s uh, were teams that the nine guys that went out there were ready to do or die. And Lefty was the leader of that. I mean, when we entered a game, uh, you knew we we're going to do whatever it, it possibly took. And, and you had that feeling from the guy on your left, the guy on your right, and the guy on the mound. Lefty was lefty, and, and his focus was his focus. And on game day, you absolutely left him alone and, and uh, let him do his thing, because it was win day. I'll tell you, when he was going to pitch, nobody even spoke to him for an hour before. He had the greatest concentration going into a ball game I ever saw in any, any pitcher. I very rarely remember Lefty changing his routine. You know, going out there, uh, first off working extremely hard in between starts, and then coming in the day he pitched talking about, hey, this is win day. I remember when you, on days when you pitched, when 
I came in and I come to the ballpark pretty early, 3.30, you were already there and it was wind day. <laughs> and from the first guy that got in there, it was like, okay, today is wind day. And that was your theme the whole time. And then before the game started, you put cotton in your ears and we were all, <laughs> we were all keyed up. And going on the field, you put in cotton and go out there and pitch and not say anything the rest of the night. Uh, Steve was a little different. Uh, he did some things on the bench when he pitched. Uh, I remember him uh, sitting on the bench and he had his cotton in his ears and to be talking to himself and uh, this was an experience I'd never seen before when he'd be talking and saying things like let your ability come through, let your ability shine, you know we have the ability, let's go, let's go and he'd be in a somewhat of a trance. Every time he went out there he was going to give you a great effort, it was going to be a low scoring game, he was going to get you a hit, he'd, he'd pick you off a runner. As an infielder I think the easiest thing to do is play behind him because there was no indecisiveness on his part. He knew what his game plan was before the umpire said play ball. He visually went over every hitter in the locker room. He knew what he wanted to do. He knew how he wanted to get him out. He knew how he wanted us to play. I mean, there were many times in a pitcher's meeting when he said, I want you to play here on this hitter. If the ball goes the other place, it's my fault. And nine times out of 10, we'd be in the right place. And that's not coincidental because he knew what he wanted to do out there. Anytime you see a pitcher in total command like that, you're, all, you're alert, you're on your toes, you're ready for action. Uh, if, if you diagram the way a young pitcher should throw a baseball, and from, from the very beginning of the, the toe on the rubber, the arm motion, the arm location, uh, the grip on the ball. I caught a lot of good pitchers, but Steve, from a 60 feet, 6 inches away of perfection, he was as close as, as anybody I caught. You know, it's quality of life in other areas, you know. Uh, quality of life on the field is one thing, but uh, there's so many times I saw young players, you know, Bev and myself would be, you know, dressed up and uh, going out in Chicago all day games at that time and uh, going out to a really nice, nice restaurant, having, you know, enjoying that sort of thing. And, uh, and I'd, I'd see these two or three guys, young kids, come in with a, a, a sack of hamburgers going up to their room to play cards. I said, this is, you know, that is correct, I mean, for them. But I said, well, there is another way. I mean, there's, there's parts of life that, you know, you should enjoy. I mean, you should understand food and the quality of food and then the wine and how the, the marriage of those two ingredients are, you know, how that science works, you know. He used to take Rick Shue and I out to dinner and uh, one night in Cincinnati we went to a real nice restaurant and Lefty was showing us the ropes, you know, and he would always order wine and champagne for us and, and uh, this night we had got a bad bottle of champagne that was flat, I guess. But uh, anyway, he orders it, about 150 bucks. Guy brings it and Lefty tastes it and says it's flat, you know. And uh, looked at both Rick and I and said, hey, uh, you know, you agree, this is flat, yo. Well, of course, Rick and I were gonna say whatever Lefty wanted and say, yeah, it's flat, you know. <laughs> so uh, the guy took it back and brought us another bottle and uh, Rick and I talked about that for a year later. The air, airplane flights and stuff like that, uh, some of us would, uh, would be the benefactors of a little glass of a, a great Chardonnay once in a while, you know, and... Uh... It happened to me with, with Tim McCarver and, uh, and Mike Shannon and Dal Maxwell when I was young. They took me out and they showed me the good restaurants, you know, and, you know, this is, this is pretty neat stuff. We weren't born with silver spoons in our mouth, but we uh, were determined that uh, if, um, if we did make a few bucks, uh, we were going to spend it, and we spent it very well, too. It's part of the art of living. We, we were out having a couple of drinks one night, and he said, why are you putting that in? You said, if you're going to drink anything, at least drink this. I don't remember what it was. He told me, he said, and less calories. And le I went through the whole thing, and, and uh, a 20-minute dissertation on, on uh, the values of, of know, knowing, knowing what you're putting in your body. Uh, whether I heard what he said or not wasn't the point. The point was that it mattered that much, and he's, he was so passionate about that. I got to know in a few different cities what time the sun came up, because after Lefty pitched, he, he wanted to talk about the game. He, well, he just wanted to talk, period. And, and somebody was going to have to listen. And I was the fortunate or maybe unfortunate victim on a few occasions, but... Uh, that was a time when you really got to know Lefty. Let's have some fun. Let's play some ball and uh, you know learn, learn the game, learn how to win, learn how to think. You know, take it. Uh, if, if you don't succeed in the game, take it elsewhere. But let's learn. When I went to work for the Phillies after the end of the '76 football season, uh, I walked down to Lefty's locker and he said, uh, "I don't like to run." 
you know, that cold stare that he gives you. And I said, well, I don't like to see you run either, Lefty, but you're not opposed to a little hard work, are you? You know, he jumped right on it. He was beautiful. I think when I first took over, there was some speculation that Steve and I were going to have some problems, mainly because uh, he was a non-runner, and everybody perceived me as a guy that wanted a pitching staff that ran an awful lot. But once I found out and worked with Steve and Gus Heffling, uh, their program over the winter time, uh, uh, I got to understand that it was uh, Steve's way of preparing himself, not only physically, but it was a great mental preparation for him. To see a guy that that big be able to do those things is was actually frightening, you know, uh, just uh, an inspiration. There's no question in my mind that it extended my career. You know, I think there was a time in my early 30s, uh, that's about when I ran into Gus, you know, in early 30s, and uh, I, I probably could have been out of the game in uh, three or four years, and, and uh, he got a hold of me and, and started training me in another fashion. Uh, Gus's program uh, works you in, with the idea of 360 degrees of range of motion. There's not just constant, say, motion back and forth as you might do in running, just kicking the legs up and down. You know, you're, you're kicking sideways, kicking backwards, you're raising forward, you're squatting, you're, you're coming up, you're kicking out. So you're getting, you're getting strength and flexibility throughout the range of motion with this program, which makes it so, so diverse. And, uh, you know, once you're a martial artist, you're, you're never not a martial artist. So it's something uh, you always adapt to your training methods, and this is something I'll always do. I, I think I was a better, a better athlete at the end of my career than I was at the beginning. I, I could do things physically where I couldn't, at the end of my career, that I couldn't do in the beginning because I was, you know, limited in certain uh, 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 agility, skills, and flexibility and strength. And and Gus brought that all out and uh, through his training methods. And I was a, I was a better athlete. I moved quicker. I, I, th I thought I, you know, I did things better with more balance uh, at the end of my career. Than, you know, I could sense that I did it early on. You know, I'm sort of limited. You know, it was hard work. And you know, for six years, I, it was Gus and myself in that back room. You know, we had uh, we went one on one. You know, for two or three hours every day for six years, and nobody came back there. It was, it's a personal thing. It's a, it's a pride thing. You know, I, I enjoyed it. I had an interest in martial arts. Uh, I, had, I had an interest in all that that uh, Gus was capable of uh, teaching, and uh, we, we, you know, we hit it off immediately. We were just, we were made for each other. You know, as another teacher it came to my life at a pr at a proper time. He's the fiercest competitor I've ever seen. Every fourth day was win day for him. Believe me. Lefty's a great teacher. He teaches the martial arts well. Uh, he could explain baseball to the younger pitchers. Well, I think everybody's a teacher, not, you're not even knowing him, because I observe people and, and learn. But take take the pressure off the arm with your legs. You, see, you look at Ryan, he is striding long and powerful. I threw any pitch at any time. Really? Never let him figure you out. Yeah. So you have to sh show that you can throw a strike before you can not throw a strike. Yeah. So he made me throw a, a strike with my slider, and then once I established I could, then I go back on strike zone. Remember, you don't have to get them out. They have to hit you. Put the pressure on them. One of the big obstacles in life is yourself. And the grid work and the and your thinking, your hang-ups, you know. The biggest thing in life is to get out of your own way and let your talent. This knows what it wants to do. Big, mean, and aggressive. That's where you want to get. Because if you look that way, I mean, you don't have to be that in your heart, but if you look that way, he thinks that you are that. Right, it's all appearance anyway. It's an act. You got a great arm. Allow yourself to win. You know, end, ending up here and, and doing the things, uh, you know, post-career kind of endeavors that we're doing here uh, makes me think back. I, I, I believe uh, Ruley Carpenter, when I signed one of the contracts under him, had about 33 things in there that I wasn't allowed to do. Most of them are the obvious, you know, the skydiving and the auto racing competitively and, and you know skiing and motorcycle riding were in there but uh, not as maybe radical or dangerous as some of those um, other endeavors I mentioned but uh, took up skiing had a wonderful time with skiing I think it's something everyone at any level should do it's just one of the most beautiful feelings that you can ever have it's so exhilarating coming off the top of a mountain you know just above Timberline and and skiing down the mountain, it, you know, be it green or intermediate or black, uh, it's, it's just a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful feeling at, at any of that level. It's, it's so rewarding. Another thing that is, is quite exhilarating along those lines, and it was also my country, is I couldn't scuba dive. And you know, we've done a number of dives down in the Cayman Islands and uh, 
and done the Cayman Trench and the night dives off the wall and and things like that. It's just it's just the most wonderful, peaceful feeling. It's not it's not the physical thing of of say what uh, skiing might be, but it's it, it's something equal in its reward and satisfaction, the peacefulness, the the singular feeling that you get being with the elements like that. Uh, that you could interact with these these animals. It was just so such a great feeling and you know stingray alley is another place these animals are so big and powerful just this wingspan when they flap their 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 wings in the in the water just you realize the power of, of these of these animals they just they move you around at will some of the the most memorable other than baseball experiences and the wonderful times we had are, are from those two extremes from the tops of the mountains to the say the cayman trench Motorcycle riding out here is grand. There's uh, there's no helmet lawn in Colorado in the, the mountains. There's nothing, you know, tremendous feeling riding in the mountains. You know, above Timberline, you know, up to Silverton or Uray or any of these great spots in Colorado Monument Valley over in Utah. We take two, three day rides. It's it's wonderful, great experience. There's there's such an abundance of things to do out here. There's Horseback riding and hiking and camping and skiing and biking and you know mountain biking and I work out every day and I do just a, a multitude of things that uh, just replace the energy that you were putting into something that you did for so long. Here's here's dinner. Think we can get much off that? I think that came out of my shoulder. I don't know. Or that might be my shoulder. There's a lot of comedy, a lot of humor in baseball, which most people would know. The clubhouse stuff is insane quite often, and you're never hurting for laughs in the, in baseball. But Something I really enjoyed about Lefty was his laugh. I mean, he'd laugh a lot, but the way he left, he had a loud, kind of distinct laugh. Most anything would make him laugh. Um, you hit a bad golf shot, he would he would start rolling. <laughs> you know, that's what he did a lot. He would go around quoting different movies, and you just find yourself trying to picture what movie it, it was from. He also loved movies, but his favorite movie had to be Animal House. Big, big fans of Caddyshack. We would go into... Um, a 15-minute dissertation, a 15, just ruin the whole script, and he would pick up any anybody's slack if they couldn't quite get their line. We don't need no stinking bodges <laughs> from Blazing Saddles. Animal House was was one of the movies that uh, that he enjoyed quoting. Us. I think Lefty told me he had seen Animal House over 40 times. Kind of decided to have a team party, and from the time we met in the lobby till the time we got back to the hotel. He was Eric Stratton, Rush Chairman. Damn glad to meet everybody. <laughs> I remember in Pittsburgh, on the road, and I heard a little bit of noise out in the hallway, and the lefty was in the hallway with a with three wood, and uh, he was hitting Philly golf balls. You know. And I looked down the halls, and all of a sudden there was a, a little white golf ball flying by, and and it would catch into the wells of the door wells there and it would rattle back and forth like a We said, Lefty, what are you trying to do, you know? He said, well, I'm trying to hit the end of that door without touching the walls or the ceilings to hit the metal door down at the end. And so I proceeded to just lay down in the wells there and just watch the golf balls flying down the hall and well, everybody ducked their heads back in the door and all you heard was bang, 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 bang. And after about 16, 17 shots, something like that, all of a sudden you, you heard, I did it. Well, the next day at the ballpark in Pittsburgh, Eddie Ferenz comes in and calls a team meeting. And uh, it was pretty simple. He just said the green fees on the 13th floor are 1600 bucks and left it at that. <laughs> yeah, you got to show them how to spend their money, you know. We were good at that, you know. The teams we were on were just wild. I guess everybody was kind of caught up in that. Lefty, along with the other players, did have a problem with buses. Nowadays, guaranteed air-conditioned buses. 
We had a lot of the old Ockmerts buses and things that never had air conditioning. It was inevitable that coming home after a road trip, especially if we had a bad time, uh, he's known to break a couple of windows. And <laughs> Lefty would just kick the windows out. Spider webs are what they call them when they, all those lines appear in the window. Well, boy, boys will be boys. He was always joking around, loved the head butting. You know, I mean, that was one of, he went through a two year stage where if anything went right, I, I avoided him because he could crack your head open. Because I think one of the other things uh, I would put right on the top of, of Lefty's fun list was uh, instigating food fights. He enjoyed that. We were in Los Gatos, California, outside of San Francisco. We had a real good dinner, and uh, there was, this was kind of a special night for Lefty that uh, the, the mayor came out and, uh, you know, at this real nice restaurant. And He got a lot of tension and stress, I think, released by throwing food anytime, anywhere. <laughs> They bring us out a big cake, and uh, Lefty just tore the hell out of the whole place. And uh, we had a great night, though. It never hurt anybody, but eventually he got around to everybody. But I think the first one he did head by that night was the mayor's wife. <laughs> he turned to the mayor. The mayor's wife was sitting next to him, and the mayor was over there, and he grabbed her to the back of the neck. Wham! Put a knot right on her forehead. <laughs> uh, he would drive me up a wall on camera night. You know, he, he hated going out, <laughs> parading around the field and having his picture taken with the fans. Well, being an introvert, I mean, why would you want to go stand out thousand, for a thousand people and have everybody have you say or smile, you know, that many times? That wasn't my nature, and it was, that, was, that was a painful thing for me. I, I, that was, uh, that was, I understand from the fans' viewpoint, for me, it was like a, a petting zoo. It was very dehumanizing. He and I would have kind of a game every year. He would hide somewhere. <laughs> And uh, I would send people after him, and I would go down myself looking for him. And we did. We did. Have a, we had a lot of laughs with it because I remember Giles used to come hunting me up, and I'd be you know, I'd crawl underneath the stadium or something, someplace to hide. He couldn't find me. He would get in the closet or hide in the concession stands or whatever. And Bill stopped trying after years. And Steve, I used to look at him often, and I'd say, you know what? You're just strange. That's all. You're strange. And he would laugh and and, and kind of flick his eyes up like that. Uh, we were at the vet working out, uh, and I was in right field shagging. Lefty was at shortstop, bouncing all over the place, catching ground balls, had a ton of life, and we, we all marveled at his endurance, and we knew his strength. But McCarver, uh, who, when I looked, saw him come in that day, I knew he didn't feel too good. He had just got done hitting in the cage, and he was walking out to right field to me, and, I mean, he was dragging. And, and I just said to him, I said, he got you, didn't he? He said, the only thing I can figure out, and as we looked in at Lefty bouncing all over the place, catching ground balls, he said, the only thing I can figure out is that there's two of them. There's one home right now, he's sleeping, and when we go home, he gets up and this one goes to bed. He said, nobody can be that strong. Uh, I remember one trip where Lefty was so proud of his blazer, okay, his Chevrolet blazer. And uh, uh, he was proud of all of the things that it held in the trunk. And naturally, it's one of the early hatchbacks and everything, and it did hold a lot. So Steve thought that he had to fill the thing up. I mean, you can't have any empty room. So he carried rope, and he carried glue, and he carried uh, uh, tape, and he carried, I mean, he carried some the most unimaginable things. And the, the strangest thing, I had to turn to him and say, Lefty, you're strange. He, the strangest thing that he carried on this one trip was caulking. It's a, it was a caulking gun, and, and it had a little trigger, and it spewed out those little uh, skewering things on the end. And I said, why are you carrying this? Are we, we going to work on a house, possibly? Are we going to paint a room while we're out there? So he said, you never know when you need it. I said, Lefty, you're strange. You're just strange. <laughs> I'm driving. He's dozing. And we get to the, uh, we're right near Mitchell, South Dakota, and a pheasant gets up from the medium strip, and in crossing, I run into it, feathers go everywhere in the whole bit, and then the light comes on, okay? The, the beak of the pheasant had gone in the grill, spewing uh, antifreeze out all over the, so we get out and look at it, and Lefty says, I got just the thing for that, and he went back, he went back, and, and got this caulking gun, he caulks in 
Island into the radiator. Now, we're 40 miles away from nowhere. Mitchell, South Dakota is nowhere is built. There's no service stations a whole bit. It's cold. It's, it's 4.30 in the afternoon. There's not a lot of traffic. Lefty is caulking this uh, cotton material, takes the bill out, and sure enough, it spews out. Lefty sold that blazer about eight years later. The caulking was still in it. Brilliant. I said, you're not strange. You're brilliant. <laughs> We've built a, uh, an earth home of sorts where we have uh, dirt as it, as it is all over the top of the, the house covered with dirt because it's, it's that style. As you can see the dirt on, there is a part of the house that sticks out through the dirt and that's the third level of the home but it is just a, uh, it's like it's an earth home. It's not dark like a cave like you might imagine and we, we love it, it feels wonderful. You know, being in the earth like that is just, it, it feels, it has an energy, it feels great. Then in the magical year of 1980, while earning his third Cy Young Award, the ultimate baseball warrior helped lead his team to its first pennant in 30 years. With the Phillies up three games to two against Kansas City in the World Series, the stage was set for one of the wildest parties in Philadelphia sports history. There was a feeling that, that I, it's hard to describe, but I knew when I left the, for the park that day that we were going to be world champions. Be riding to the ballpark for game six of the World Series, riding down Route 42, I knew it was over. I think all of us felt very comfortable that uh, we had a darn good chance of doing something that the uh, Philadelphia Phillies hadn't done in, in over 100 years. times and you, you appreciate you have you have a sense of love for these people uh, you can understand their pain of, of, of not having anything like that for a long period of time and it started the game last night won it he's gonna be the Cy Young Award winner Lefty Speed After his strike shortened 81, Lefty resumed his championship form while on his way to winning an unprecedented fourth Cy Young Award. The following year, he became the leading strikeout pitcher in baseball history. And while Nolan Ryan has since surpassed him, it's doubtful that Lefty's 4,136 strikeouts will be matched by anyone else. While helping the Phillies win another pennant, Steve Carlton reached another milestone in the city where his career began. Lefty won his 300th game, leaving the St. Louis faithful to mutter, what if? Upon his arrival home, Lefty broke his silence and acknowledged the loyal Philadelphia fans. I look forward to playing in a Philadelphia uniform for many, many more years. Thank you. But sadly, the years of constant strain began to take their toll on the once powerful left shoulder. After Steve missed most of 1985 and struggled through the beginning of 86, an emotional Bill Giles made the toughest decision of his career. He always told me he wanted to pitch till he was 50 years old. He, he uh, was disappointed, I think, that he could, couldn't pitch till he was 50. The three toughest things I had to do in baseball was to release Tug McGraw, Pete Rose, and Steve Carlton. And Steve was the hardest because he'd been with us so long. And the Steve Carlton era has ended in Philadelphia. The greatest left-hand pitcher in Philly's history. And one of the greatest pitchers of all time will no longer be pitching.
in Philadelphia. On Steve's last day as a Philly, the team left town for a road trip and never got the chance to wish him well. In an unprecedented gesture of affection, his friends and teammates sent a farewell tape to the big left-hander. Go get him, Rocket Man. Wish all the luck in the world. See you later, big boy. Here's to you, buddy. We got you here in our coach's room. You'll always be a part of this room as long as we're here. Thanks for everything that you taught me and everything that you helped me with. Hey, Lefty, you stud. I'm missing you over here. As you can see, I'm getting ready to do my basic workouts. And uh, it's not the same back there without you showing us a way. Okay, Lefty, since you've been gone, I've been a hell of a lot richer. I've been saving my money on the road trips. And Good luck, Lefty. We love you, I love you. And sitting behind that tunnel for 14 years, you're the greatest left-handed pitcher i ever seen. Good luck, Lefty. I hope you do good over there. Don't forget about the bone man. I know you'll survive. I know you'll win some games. I know you got a chance to win another Cy Young before it's all over. You were the greatest, baby, and you still are. Good luck. Just like a, a fine Rothschild wine. Uh, you're the best that there is, and it's, uh, it's been my pleasure being associated with you. Over the years, I've had so much fun with you off the field. You're, you're a joy to be with, and I, I hope our relationship and our friendship will continue for an awful lot of years. I love you, Phil. Good luck to you. Happily, Lefty's relationship with his old club remains strong, and in return, the Phillies paid Steve the highest compliment any franchise can award a player. No other Philly will ever wear number 32. In a warm ceremony celebrating the retirement of his number, Steve was truly eloquent in expressing his feelings to those with whom he had spent the last 25 years. Thank you all. And you really need the support of your family to play a long career in this game. And they've been wonderful. These guys are great. I love them. I must take this time to say something about the sports writers. There'll be silence for the next 10 minutes. In all seriousness, I must uh, thank them for the way they treated me. And Bill, I can't thank you enough. It's been wonderful. The years that I spent here with Philadelphia, Ruley was here earlier, brings back great memories. And, and as you fans know, that I tried with my concentration to block you out and all the external noise in this stadium. But all those years, I was just kidding. I really knew you were here. I could feel your energy. I could feel your presence in Philadelphia. Baseball is a field of dreams, and this surely is heaven down here. And I thank you once again. It's been wonderful. I love you.
To play baseball, you need a ball, a bat, two teams, four bases, and a field. But if you really want to play ball, you need Lenny Dykstra, Darren Dalton, Mariano Duncan, and Danny Jackson. You need the National League champion Philadelphia Phillies. And to get them, you need Prism. Prism plays hardball with exclusive home game action you won't see on any other channel. It's real baseball, Phillies baseball, all summer long on Prism. Don't miss any of the action. Call your cable company and order Prism, the channel that knows how to play ball.